Good afternoon. I'm Harold Holzer, and I have the privilege of serving as the director of Roosevelt House. On behalf of Hunter College President Jennifer Rabb, it's a pleasure for me to welcome all of you for a virtual Roosevelt House program, the first of the fall semester. Before we begin, I do want to mention how pleased we are to continue throughout the semester the Roosevelt House tradition of civic engagement on public policy, human rights, and Roosevelt era history, the three pillars of our mission. While of course we look forward to the day when we can again gather in person in our historic setting, I am happy that we can stay connected with Roosevelt House audience, both its loyal longtime members and those who are new through Zoom events like this one. And next week on Tuesday, as a reminder, please join us again for a discussion of one of the giants of the Roosevelt era, his third term vice president, Henry Wallace. And our discussion will feature Wallace's grandson, David Wallace Douglas, in conversation with John Nichols, who's the author of a new book called The Fight for the Soul of the Democratic Party, The Enduring Legacy of Henry Wallace's Anti-Fascist, Anti-Racist Politics. Meanwhile, as we all seek to navigate an imperiled future, there could be no better time for a discussion of how one of the most secretive and powerful federal agencies has endeavored, succeeded, and sometimes failed to, to steer our nation through, if not prevent, some of the most perilous and uncertain periods of the past. It's especially fitting that we host this timely and important discussion from the home of a president whose early recognition of the need for a more robust intelligence service prompted him to establish the Office of Strategic Services, the OSS, which provided a model for the CIA and became a precursor to its formation shortly after World War II. Tonight, I'm delighted to welcome back to Roosevelt House writer, journalist, television producer, and documentary filmmaker, Chris Whipple. Back in 2017, we had the pleasure of welcoming Chris in person at Roosevelt House, the actual landmark building, for a memorable conversation with Tom Brokaw about his bestseller, The Gatekeepers, a group biography of the White House Chiefs of Staff. Three years later, it remains a Roosevelt House highlight. If you haven't seen it, I suggest after tonight's program that you make a, a Chris Whipple double header by visiting the Roosevelt House website where you'll find the video of that conversation, which I think is as relevant today as ever. With his new contribution, the highly anticipated book, The Spy Masters, How the CIA Directors Shape History and the Future, Chris once again parlays unparalleled access to chronicle the ways in which those who serve the government at its highest level, whether as White House chiefs of staff or directors of the CIA, so often define the directions of the country during its most trying times, for better or for worse. The outcome, as Chris shows in both books, often depends on the critical relationship between the president and the officials who bear the awesome responsibility of briefing him. As another favorite Roosevelt House guest, historian Jonathan Alter put it, the best way to learn the history of the CIA is from the top. And that's where Chris Ripple, Whipple goes with amazingly candid interviews with the spy masters. That's Jonathan's words. Chris's new book takes as its basis exclusive and extensive interviews with nearly every living CIA director, often referred to as the person who must tell the president what he does not want to hear. In one of the most difficult and significant jobs in all of government, the agency blocks foreign interference in our elections, stops devastating attacks like the one we memorialized just last week on the 19th anniversary of 9-11. And Chris has developed an extraordinary account based on his access and his reputation. A multiple award-winning producer at 60 Minutes and Prime Time, Chris is a frequent and authoritative television guest, and his writing has appeared in the New York Times and the Washington Post. He also produced and wrote the groundbreaking 2015 Showtime film, 
the spy masters, CIA in the crosshairs. Through clear-eyed and even-handed journalism across media delivered in compellingly wrought narratives, Chris has established himself as a trusted voice on the essential but often hidden truths of how our government functions both domestically and around the world in very complicated times. Now this evening, Chris will be in conversation with award-winning national security reporter, Julian Barnes, and we're delighted to welcome him as well. He's now in his second stint at the New York Times, covering the CIA and intelligence agencies for its Washington Bureau. He has already broken news on the CIA whistleblower and his initial complaints about the Ukraine call, the extraction of a key CIA spy in Russia, cyber commands counteroffensive on Russia during the midterm elections, and how intelligence agencies have tracked the coronavirus pandemic. Julian's extensive experience includes being embedded with the 101st Airborne Division during the initial invasion of Iraq, more than three years in Brussels writing on international security for the Wall Street Journal, and over a decade covering the US military and national security issues in DC. I can think of no better person than Julian to engage with Chris on the top secret decisions that affect us all and underpin our nation through, throughout modern history and into the future. Now tonight's presentation, lasting about 45 minutes, will be followed by an audience Q&A moderated by Roosevelt House's own Mac Barrett. So I urge you to use the Q&A function on your laptops to submit questions. They will be answered in the order they're received. So start whenever the spirit moves you. With that, Chris and Julian, thank you both for talking with us tonight, for taking the time to discuss this vital topic. So now please join me in welcoming Chris Whipple in conversation with Julian Barnes. Thanks everybody. And thanks for joining me to speak with Chris about his book, The Spy Masters. Uh, Chris in recent years may have had better access to the former directors of Central Intelligence than anybody else. His book is a great read. I encourage everyone to go out and get it. It's got vivid history and insights to our, our current time. Um, and what I found one of the best parts was how Chris notes the echoes of the history to the, to the current day. You know, when I'm reporting about Trump and the intelligence community, it often seems like these things are without precedent, that this president is different than, than everyone else. Um, uh, he is he's failing to listen to his intelligence officers or 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 not hearing information he disagrees with uh, publicly chastising his intelligence chiefs um, Trump has done those things in ways that that seem different but as you read Chris's book you you see examples of other presidents doing things that look kind of similar um, and I hope that's one of the themes that we can talk about um, and you know, I, that's kind of where I want to start, too. Um, you know, Chris, your reporting on Trump and his intelligence uh, chiefs uh, sort of seems to echo what uh, I and others have reported. You know, it's very hard to get through to Trump, um, you know, especially on issues of Russian interference and other things he doesn't want to hear about. Uh, I'm curious about what you learned about how the CIA tries to get around that, and, and maybe you could talk about some of the historical precedents as well. Yeah, you know, let me begin just by saying, first of all, that I'm really thrilled to be here and honored that you're, uh, to be in conversation with you, Julian. So thank you. Thank you for doing this. Um, it is absolutely true that the more things change, um, the more they seem the same when it comes to the CIA and the president. Um, you know, as Harold was suggesting earlier, it's hard to overstate the importance of the position. The CIA director is the person we depend on to prevent another Pearl Harbor, 9-11, or lethal uh, pandemic. Uh, but it's an almost impossible juggling act as well, uh, because you have to be able to tell the president hard truths as CIA director while also having his ear. 
And a great example of that uh, was Richard Helms with LBJ. Um, I start the book um, with Helms uh, and it's 70 years of history from Helms to, to Gina Haspel. Uh, but there are <clears throat> recurring themes throughout. Helms had a very difficult time with LBJ. It was a fascinating relationship. Uh, he admired LBJ, but he was exasperated by Vietnam, by the Vietnam War. And LBJ demanded intelligence, <clears throat> suggesting, <clears throat> excuse me, that the bombing of North Vietnam would bring the enemy to the negotiating table. And Helms had to keep telling him, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. President, actually the opposite is true. Uh, at one point, Helms even authorized, on his own authority, he commissioned a study of the underlying premise of the whole war, which was the so-called domino theory. Uh, the theory that if South Vietnam fell, that all of Southeast Asia would topple like dominoes. Well, it was, the, res the, the report concluded that it was completely flawed uh, and that that was unlikely to happen. LBJ didn't want to hear about it. Uh, and I, there's a great story that I tell in the book about uh, Robert McNamara finding this memo years later and calling up <clears throat> the Helms household and, and chewing out uh, poor Cynthia Helms, his, his widow. Uh, so this has been true for a long time. Um, CIA directors have to be able to tell presidents what they don't want to hear. And that is hard in the best of times. It may be mission impossible now for Gina Haspel, the current CIA director and the first woman ever to run uh, the agency with, with a person like Donald Trump. So with Haspel and the current team, you know, the biggest challenge has been talking about Russian meddling, Russian disinformation from <clears throat> when he arrived, Trump didn't want to hear it. The, the solution that Trump's briefer, Beth Sanner has apparently had is wrap that unpalatable information with uh, other information about what other countries are doing but then we get the situation like we're in now, where we have a White House presenting China and Iran as equal threats to, to Russia. Is this a danger when you're trying to kind of bend to the president that you could end up like misleading not just the White House, but the American public? It is absolutely dangerous when the intelligence community, under pressure from a president who doesn't want to hear hard truths, starts skewing intelligence and soft peddling reality, because that way lies disaster. Uh, we are suffering the catastrophic consequences of a pandemic that the pre warnings of which the president ignored in his president's daily brief throughout January, uh, and 200,000 Americans almost have now died. So it could not be more dangerous. And we can talk more about this, uh, certainly a lot to talk about with, when it comes to Gina Haspel, but my view about the, um, the, the Russian attacks on the election and the way that's being dealt with is that <clears throat> the, the CIA director, in addition to briefing the president, has to be the honest broker of intelligence to Congress and the American people. And when the director of national intelligence, John Ratcliffe, announced that he was no longer going to brief Congress about the Russian assault or impending attack on the election in 2020. I think, in my view, Gina Haspel as CIA director should have said, fine, I will brief them. Because that is the responsibility of the CIA director to be the honest broker of intelligence. You have to be able to testify in public about threats to the United States uh, to, so that it makes it more difficult to politicize those threats in private. That's a really important function. A CIA officer grows up uh, collecting intelligence uh, and intending to keep it secret. Um, once you become the director, once uh, or the person in the director's job does have a little public communication role, but we never see Gina Haspel. We've seen her two lectures at colleges, um, only twice testifying before Congress. Um, 
can it work to have the director be in the shadows or is democracy safer when we occasionally hear from the director? Well, it's it, first of all, she's a fascinating character and I have a whole chapter uh, about Trump and his CIA directors, Pompeo and, and Gina Haspel, as well as an epilogue that, uh, that lays out what Trump knew and when he knew it and what the intelligence, intelligence community told him. But she is fascinating because uh, you know, she flies under the radar. She's a mystery woman. Very little is known about her. Uh, she came out of Kentucky, the University of Louisville. She cut her teeth as a covert operative in the back alleys of Africa. By all accounts, she was very successful as a, in the clandestine service, so-called. Um, she then went to, as we all know, infamously, she, she was sent to the uh, CIA black site in Thailand. Uh, and I have some previously unreported stories about her time there. Um, but it was, the answer to your question is that secrecy is in her DNA. I mean, that's, that's she spent her entire career trying to be invisible. But I think it's a real mistake when you're CIA director, which is a very public uh, position in which, as I say, you're the honest broker for the country as well as the president. You have to be able to, uh, to address the public, testify before Congress, work the halls of Congress. Uh, nobody was better at that than Leon Panetta. Um, but I think it was a mistake, it may sound self-serving, but a mistake for Gina Haspel and Pompeo uh, not to do interviews with me um, because you think about the iconic directors in the history of the CIA, Richard Helms, Bob Gates, Leon Panetta, George Tenet, they weren't afraid to answer hard questions, and they should. You know, the the last time we heard from Gina Haspel, she was, I think, uh, she was standing, <coughs> uh, sitting next to Dan Coates when they testified in February 2019 uh, to Congress on worldwide threats. Uh, they presented a different uh, view on some critical issues, North Korea's willingness to give up nuclear weapons, uh, the state of ISIS, Iran, then the White House position. The next day, the president took to Twitter and said, go back to school. This is a president who has demonized the intelligence community. Um, when I was reading your book, I, I saw echoes of that in the Nixon time, when Nixon is deeply frustrated. Um, I, can you talk a little bit about that, about that parallel between uh, Richard Nixon's relationship with the intelligence agencies and Trump's uh, relations and, and where yeah. they're the same, where they're different. Yeah, it's, it's a hardly the first time that we've had a president who was convinced that the CIA was a so-called deep state uh, populated by liberal enemies who were hell-bent on, on tearing him down and defeating his agenda. That's what Richard Nixon thought of the CIA and of Richard Helms, the director at the time. Uh, he thought he was this uh, effete, martini-sipping uh, elitist, uh, part of the Georgetown set, who would go around and make fun of him at night um, at cocktail parties. Um, maybe, maybe he did, but Nixon was convinced that um, he was up against uh, the enemy in, in the form of the CIA. So this is not the first time it's happened, um, but Trump takes this to a whole new level, uh, in my view. And I, I, I wrote a, an op-ed for the Washington Post a few weeks ago in which I said that Trump is essentially unbriefable. Uh, it's partly because he doesn't read. Uh, he doesn't read the president, president's daily brief. He's incurious. He thinks he knows everything worth knowing. And he brings such contempt for the agency uh, into office with him that he's he just won't believe anything they tell him. Um, we've never seen it at this level. And um, Nixon may have thought that the CIA was against him, but it was really a delusion. And it is on Trump's part as well. These are people, as you well know, who, of course, they're human beings and they have political leanings. Uh, but by and large, they are people who try to keep their heads down, the CIA employees, uh, and ignore whoever is in the Oval Office at any given time, and ignore uh, all of the abuse that they take uh, from the likes of Nixon and Trump. 
and they, they want to get the job done and they want to have a director who has their backs. Uh, it's, it's that simple. In your Nixon sections, you, you present the CIA as both doing some, making some very good decisions, resisting, uh, participating in a Watergate cut up, uh, cover up, but also making some errors, g giving Nixon too much on, on domestic spying. What went wrong there? What did they, what did they get right? What did they get wrong when, when dealing with Nixon? And does it tell us anything about today? For me, Helms, of course, Helms, as we know, spanned LBJ and Nixon presidencies. And he's just the most compelling character. Uh, you, you know, I, I always felt that John le Carre couldn't make these guys up. Uh, it's such a great cast of characters. But Helms was a, you know, a, a marvelous uh, character, dry martini in one hand and cigarette in the other, and a kind of a James Bond-like character. Uh, which is the way Bob Gates described him to me. Um, but he was brilliant, but he was also flawed, and he was complicated, and he, he had a very interesting relationship with LBJ. His widow, Cynthia Helms, died last summer, but uh, before that, I spent quite a bit of time with her, and she was fascinating and full of untold stories. And she said to me, you know, Chris, they were all asked to do things they shouldn't have done. And there's no question about it that Richard Helms, wanting to please LBJ, crossed the line on a number of occasions. LBJ demanded evidence that there was foreign communist control of the anti-Vietnam War movement. And so Helms, who should have known better, went out and started Operation MH Chaos, an illegal surveillance operation uh, following uh, domestic uh, protesters and of course produced no evidence of foreign communist control. But he broke the law and he violated the CIA's charter. At the end of the day, however, when it came down to Haldeman calling him into the White House and pressuring him to, in, in, trying to enlist him in the Watergate cover-up, famously asking him to shut down the FBI investigation into Watergate, Helms drew the line. Uh, he balked, uh, thereby, in my view, uh, not only upholding the rule of law, but, but really arguably saving the CIA. He felt that had he gone along with Nixon, that he, Helms, would have gone to prison and that it would have been a fatal blow for the CIA, which was already in deep trouble. So we have some data points of the CIA resisting Trump. You know, their analysis of Khashoggi and was very different than, than Trump's. It was not what Trump wanted to hear. Um, they also don't seem to publicly back the Wuhan lab theory in the, in the COVID case, this idea that the, the um, virus escaped from a Chinese lab. Are those data points enough to say that under Haspel they're resisting politicization or can we look at other evidence where Iran is put on the same level as Russia and say they're bending too much? What's your view? My, my view is that it's a really mixed bag. It's a really mixed record with, with Gina Haspel and I think there were really high hopes for her coming in. You know, she had a reputation for being for integrity and for uh, being a straight shooter. And there were those uh, like John McLaughlin, for example, who told me that uh, she, if anybody can hold the line against this guy, uh, it's Gina Haspel. But I think the record's been disappointing. Absolutely credit uh, deserved, well-deserved credit for, for Khashoggi and for resisting Trump on that. But on so many other occasions, uh, the president has said things that um, that Haspel, I mean, he's falsified intelligence or said things that were untrue uh, that I, I feel that Haspel should have corrected. He said publicly, he boasted that uh, torture works. Gina told me it works. Well, there's almost no possibility that Gina Haspel told him that in so many words. Uh, torture very rarely, if ever, works, and she knows it. Uh, there was the time when she showed up at the State of the Union last year uh, 
CIA directors are scrupulously nonpartisan by tradition and would never show up at a State of the Union and clap like cheerleaders for the president's applause lines, but Gina Haspel did that. Uh, that did not uh, go over well in the intelligence community. And, and we could go on and on, but, but another example, again, is th the way the, the intelligence uh, report that was, that suggested that, okay, well, Russia's, Russia may be meddling in the 2020 elections, but, but China and Iran are meddling too. It was it com totally conflating completely different levels of threat. I mean, China and Iran are, have a preference in the election, but they're not intruding in any way, shape or form the way the Russians are. And again, silence. Uh, I'll give you one more example and then we can move on. Uh, when Be you mentioned Beth Sanner, the, uh, the CIA briefer, usually, you know, frankly, in the past, we've never known the names of the CIA briefers, but she's been outed, as you know. Um, Donald Trump said that on January 23, in a briefing that his CIA briefer told him that the coronavirus was no big deal. Well, there's every reason to believe that that's false. Uh, everything in the president's daily brief by definition is a big deal. Uh, everything verbally briefed to the president by a CIA briefer or a DNI briefer in this case uh, is a big deal. Uh, and yet when Trump threw his briefer under the bus, again, crickets, from Gina Haspel. Uh, so in my view, I, I think that th those high hopes for Haspel as being an honest broker are starting to fade. You know, I-, I what, do you, what do you think? I'd love to know your thoughts on it. Well, what I really liked about your book is that, um, you know, we do get a sense, I mean, you got Jose Rodriguez on the record, you're talking to him about her background. He really knows her. You have a very uh, fair and interesting um, account of her role at uh, uh, the black site um, involved in the, uh, the torture of the Al Qaeda uh, um, prisoners or enhanced interrogation techniques as the CIA says. Um, and that is always something that's been interesting to uh, me about her. It is her, the fact that she was at that base and presided over the use of those waterboarding that attracted Trump to her, that sold her to Trump. But, you know, she pretty clearly had to renounce that to Senator Warner to get the Democratic support for um, uh, nomination. Where, where do you think she and the CIA really are on, on the use of waterboarding? Trump and other torture techniques. Embrace well, I think I think there's absolutely zero possibility that uh, those methods would ever be used again. Well, I mean, maybe that's a strong statement, but that they would be used again anytime in the near future. Uh, it was actually in an interview with me that Michael Hayden, the former CIA director, famously said that if a president wants to do waterboarding again, he better bring his own bucket because we're not going down that road again. Um, and um, so, for one thing, it's now illegal, uh, as, as you know, and uh, just not a possibility. So I think that I think that that may have inured to her benefit during her confirmation hearings, because I don't think anybody thought that there was a, a realistic possibility that the CIA would go back down that road. So my colleague, Mark Mazzetti, reviewed your book um, and he, uh, he really enjoyed it clearly and uh, uh, praised it and, and praised your storytelling. Um, but when it came to the discussions of the- I there was a but coming here. What'd you say? I thought there was a but coming here. But yeah, I know, here's the but. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, he, he took issue with your, how you described the, the, tor the torture and the waterboarding, or that you gave the, the directors too much room to defend themselves on what is ultimately um, not defensible, um, to hide behind the, the legal opinions of the uh, Bush administration. Um, 
what, what, I mean, you, I'm sure you read Mark's review. What, what's, your, what's your thought on that? What was your purpose in, you know, talking to these directors about the enhanced interrogation techniques? Yeah. What were you hoping <clears throat> to hear from them? Well, I should, to begin with, I've, I've got nothing but respect for Mark Mazzetti. I think he's fantastic. And I, and of course, I tell the story in the book about his amazing feat of uh, breaking the story about the destruction of the so-called torture tapes, which uh, Gina Haspel was intimately involved in. She, she gave the order to destroy them, um, as, as we all know. Uh, so I think that the whole subject of quote unquote enhanced interrogation techniques or torture during the post 9-11 period is just so fraught. I mean, it is so, um, it, it, it sort of, it, so I, I get it. I understand where, where Mazzetti is coming from on that. Um, you know, he, um, he wrote that he thought that I had downplayed or not given enough weight to the, the Senate majority report uh, for example, which, uh, which laid out, which went on for years and years and years and laid out in voluminous detail uh, emails and, and evidence that it said showed that the so-called enhanced interrogation techniques were ineffective, that, that, that they didn't work. Um, so, and, and, I, and I obviously cited that in the book. Um, and I think that that, that aspect of, of that period was covered uh, so extensively and is so familiar to almost everyone. And the whole idea of, uh, of using these techniques, I think, is, is morally uh, beyond the pale. Um, but I wanted also to get inside the heads of the CIA directors on whose watch this took place. So I wanted to hear whether they had any, any defense for it. And uh, I got an earful. And in fairness, I do think that the majority report failed in a number of ways. I mean, it was, ri it was riddled with inaccuracies. Uh, it was sloppy. And it, they failed to interview any of the directors on whose watch this took place. And they could have. Uh, they didn't. They chose not to. Mike Morell. Uh, now again, I'm not I'm not defending the techniques, but I'm telling you what their argument is. Mike Morell, uh, who is hardly a fire-breathing conservative, uh, he was odd the odds-on favorite to be Hillary's CIA director, will tell you uh, in no uncertain terms that the, in the 20 cases that the majority report laid out, where they said uh, the techniques were ineffective. Morell will tell you that in, in, in those 20 cases, they did yield actionable intelligence that disrupted plots and saved lives. He will tell you that to his dying day. And he gave a specific example of one case where before the so-called, before the techniques were used, a terrorist told them about it, where some, one of his colleagues was, what town he was in, afterwards, he told them exactly where to find him and in which building and, and the CIA went in and got him. Uh, so it's a fraught subject and it's a sensitive subject and it's hard to, uh, you know, I tried to, I tried to handle it with some fairness to the directors, but without sugarcoating it at all. Uh, and it, it, it sort of reminds me of what uh, the great Tom Powers once said about this subject, uh, he said, you know, the CIA is not a neutral subject. Uh, there is some strong, everybody has strong feelings about what they do. You know, one thing I was struck with uh, when, where the directors had different views was, was on the Iraq war. And we all think of this as one of the great intelligence failures, and it certainly was. But you, you have voices from former uh, top officials saying, hey, look, the Bush administration was going intent on getting rid of Saddam Hussein. They were going to do it anyway. And then you've got a quote from Bob Gates saying uh, an intelligence failure like this changes history. Oh. Um, I'm, I'm wondering how you think that intelligence failure changed the CIA. Uh, are we destined to have another 
error like that somewhere down the line or are the safeguards in place to kind of pre prevent that in the future, do you think? Well, no question that it changed history. It, it, it changed the perception of the United States uh, around the world. Uh, one former acting director told me that uh, when he goes to college campuses um, these days, post uh, WMDs, that it's striking to him that he said in, in the old days, it used to be a given that the United States was seen as, as a force for good around the world. Uh, that's no longer true, and it's because of WMDs. Um, that's how dramatic he thought the change was. Uh, no question about it that it, um, all you need to do is look at the way Donald Trump exploited it in the 2016 election, when he said, these are the guys who brought us WMDs. It was a potent, uh, line of attack. It will be the first paragraph in George Tenet's obituary, even though George Tenet did a lot of good things at the CIA. Uh, Tenet was uh, absolutely fascinating character, uh, brilliant, gregarious, maybe along with Leon Panetta, the most pop, one of the most popular CIA directors of modern times. I think he deserves tremendous credit for blowing the whistle on the imminent Al-Qaeda attack in that July 10 meeting that I describe in the book. I hope we can come back to that. Um, but no question about the fact that WMDs was a, a pivotal point and, and, and really harmed the credibility of the CIA forever. Um, as to whether it could happen again, you know, I think that this is where it becomes really critical for CIA directors to be able to tell presidents hard truths. Uh, because a, a lot of people at CIA who knew George Tenet well, who know him well, felt that he just was too eager to please George W. Bush. Uh, and I lay out various theories for why this happened. Um, and I do, and I did confront Tenet point blank on the whole notion of whether I said, look, people say you cooked the books, that you were pressured by Cheney and the Bush administration and, and that you just, you, you gave them the intelligence they wanted. And he practically jumped out of his chair and he, and he said, if we wanted to cook the books, all we had to do was say that Iraq was involved in Al with Al Qaeda on 9-11, game, set, match, over. We never cooked the books, we made a mistake, we were wrong. We have to live with it. Um, you mentioned that meeting between uh, Tennant and Condi Rice, and I do want to come back to it right now because you 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 really make a pretty good case that the CIA was really knew quite a bit about Al Qaeda's 9/11 plot beforehand, and that they had a sense of urgency going to see Condi Rice. And you know, you read this and you think. Why didn't it stick? Why didn't it go through? And, and I wonder if you could tell that story a little bit and then what the lessons for the agency are of like what happens if you're not heard? How do you know if you're not heard? Yeah, it's, it's a riveting story. And in the book, I go beyond what we were able to show in the documentary because Rich Blee, who was head of the Al-Qaeda unit, the Bin Laden unit at that time, went on the record with me about that meeting. Blee was in charge of the presentation. George Tenet, it was uh, July 10, 2001, uh, when Rich Blee walked into Tenet's office and said, the sky is falling, this is coming, and we've got to warn the White House. Tenet picked up the phone. The only time he ever picked up the phone, called the White House and said, we're coming over right now. George Tenet, Kofor Black, his deputy, head of counterterrorism, and Rich Blee, raced to the White House. They went in, they met with Condi Rice, they laid it out. They didn't know the, what form the attack would take or where it would strike exactly, but thousands of Americans were gonna die. There was no doubt in their mind. Kofor Black pounded the table and said, we've gotta go on a war footing now. And they left and Kofor told me as they were walking across the West Wing parking lot, he turned to Blee and they sort of did high fives and said, we finally got through to these people. We laid it out. And I said to Kofor, what happened? And he said, yeah, what happened? 
nothing happened. Um, one of the things in the book that I bring out that we didn't touch on in the documentary we did back in 2015 is that I've talked to a number of people at CIA who thought that if Condi Rice had called a principals meeting, which is a meeting of most of the you know, high ranking cabinet uh, officials, usually chaired by the vice president or national security advisor, and they'd all gotten around a table and started dealing with this, shaking the trees, that they could have prevented 9-11. Um, Bruce Rydell, um, Rich Blee, others told me that they really felt that had they done that, they would have discovered that those two hijackers were already on US soil. Uh, the, the two hijackers who famously CIA was blamed for not having rounded up uh, or told the FBI about. Anyway, um, it's, a, it's a riveting uh, story. And as Kofer put it to me, he said, look, they just didn't want to hear about it. They're at, they're, they were in a, living in a time warp. They thought terrorists were Euro lefties who drank champagne by night and blew stuff up during the day. And they couldn't imagine a bunch of guys in a cave in Afghanistan doing what they did. I see the Q and A's uh, uh, piling up there. So I'm gonna make this my last concluding question and then we'll throw it over to Mac to, to read the audience questions. Um, when I read your book, I see this cycle of expansion and retrenchment for the CIA from uh, you know, demonizing the agency to lionizing it. Um, and I wonder what moment are we going to be in after the Trump administration? Will, uh, would we be, whether it is in, you know, 50 day, uh, whether it's in January or four years from now, what does the future hold for the agency? Is it going to be a period of uh, accountability or are we going to come to a place where um, the CIA is, is seen as uh, a place that's for facts and against conspiracy theories? What's your prediction? Well, an awful lot depends on what happens in November. Uh, and I think that um, Gina Haspel's days are probably numbered no matter who wins. Um, if Donald Trump wins, uh, the CIA is in big trouble, in my view, in the intelligence community and the, the whole possibility of, of speaking truth to power, to use that old cliche. Um, I think Haspel will be replaced by, an, by a more pliable person like uh, John Ratcliffe uh, if Trump wins. And I think the lesson if Trump wins will be stop talking about hard truths, stop talking about things he doesn't want to hear. Uh, that will make the world an, a more dangerous place in my view. Um, if he doesn't win, then I think there's a really good chance that the CIA uh, uh, recovers and, and recovers well. Um, they're pretty good. I, I, you know this, you would know this better than I probably, Julian, but they're pretty good at keeping their heads down and trying and ignoring wh whoever is in the Oval Office at any given time. The CIA director can't do that, but most of the, the workforce. Um, and God knows there are people in the clandestine service, the covert operatives who probably love the fact that um, they've kind of got free reign to do more than they used to do. Um, that's another whole subject. But long-winded answer to your question, I, I think that so much depends on what happens in November. Yes, hello, Julian. Um, I'm here to read some questions that have been uh, coming, coming in throughout the discussion. Here's one about the invasion of Iraq from George Bullough. Are there any reforms in procedure and or policy to prevent a recurrence of political manipulation of intelligence gathering practiced by Vice President Dick Cheney and or others in the run up to the US invasion of Iraq? Well, I'd love to hear Julian's thoughts on that. Um, my own thoughts are that there is this, there is this conventional wisdom that Dick Cheney went over to the CIA uh, with a loaded gun and put it to their heads and said, uh, you know, skew the intelligence and, uh, you know, tell us that there are weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. <clears throat> and, I, and I think it's a, it's a cartoon version of what actually happened. 
And if you look at the every study that's been done of that period, including some really good work by Robert Jervis, uh, a book he wrote about um, about Iran and the Iraq intelligence failures, uh, there really isn't a clear cut slam dunk, if you'll pardon the expression, case uh, for the CIA simply telling Bush what he wanted to hear. Uh, and uh, the famous slam dunk meeting in which uh, Bush uh, you know, asked, asked uh, Tenet to make a case for, the, for invading Iraq, Tenet insists, and I think he's right, that the decision had been made well before that meeting and that uh, the invasion was gonna happen. I think it's true that the invasion would have happened uh, with or without the CIA's assessment about WMDs. Uh, what do you think, Julian? Well, I think that if we look at some of the COVID reporting, we see um, some of the safeguards working. You know, there was reports about a, a DHS intelligence product uh, that said uh, the Chinese were withholding um, uh, protective gear, and that meant they knew about the seriousness of the uh, COVID um, pandemic earlier. That report was leaked, it got public, and then there was a big uh, CIA took the lead, but it was an intel-wide look, and they re-looked at that intelligence, and they they rolled it back, you know, and we learned about that. And so some of these safeguards are there. I mean, culturally, you know, Iraq still looms very large of the CIA. So as long as that's in everybody's memory, you know, that's a great protection. The question is, as we get further away from that, will that lesson be unlearned as the, or not? Jay Mendez asks, did the CIA know and fail to warn the president about the severity of COVID-19? Is the agency studying disease as a threat? So the answer to that is that the CDC is, is, takes the primary role. Um, that, I mean, they're the lead uh, agency in trying to warn about uh, pandemics headed our way. But the intelligence community plays a really strong, strong supporting role. And I suspect that when this is all over, the CIA will pay a lot more attention to, to pandemics. Uh, Jim Clapper told me that uh, back during the... Uh, uh, Ebola uh, outbreak that um, he could tell th that from the satellite imagery um, that something was something was really wrong in in, uh, in Western Africa uh, where the outbreak began, and they could tell that from satellite imagery. So they so the intelligence community is involved, and and again they it warned repeatedly in the president's daily brief in January. Uh, and the, the president simply shrugged it off uh, or, or didn't read the, the PDB to begin with. So the, the, if I understood the question correctly, uh, yes, the CIA is, is involved in those kinds of warnings. Um, the president looked the other way, and in the future, I suspect they'll be even more alert to these kinds of threats. A question from Michael Porcelli, who says that he is a former counterintelligence agent um, and asks about the honesty of uh, intelligence and the possibility of people functioning as foreign agents within the CIA and FBI. Um, the question, I suppose, is what do you do when the intelligence is not honest? Well, I love the, I, the suggestion that one thing I really haven't talked about um, in any of my appearances thus far about the book is, is, is the constant threat of moles. Um, and, and Dick Helms, um, Bob Gates told me a, a, a great story about, um, about meeting with Dick Helms when Gates became CIA director. Uh, Helms, uh, the retired director, came around and, and they went out for lunch. And Helms gave Gates his best advice. And at the end of the lunch, Helms looked at Gates and said, I've got one more thing. Never go home at night without wondering where the mole is. Not whether the mole is there, but where the mole is. Um, it's a constant problem for the CIA. Uh, 
so look, I mean, I think that by and large, the analysts at the CIA knocked themselves out trying to produce an honest product. And, and the real problem comes from outside pressure, not, not internally. But you've got you've to have your eye out for uh, moles within. Jay Lee Antonio asks if you're at all, at all fearful of the influence of Russia um, diminishing the effectiveness of US intelligence agencies. You want to try that one, Julian? <laughs> well, I mean, Russia is um, very active in the, these elections. Now, whether they are diminishing the CIA, um, you know, in some ways, China probably is the bigger threat, right? It is China that has rolled up uh, the CIA's networks. China has had the, the recent moles that have been discovered inside. So long term, it's China that is the, the challenge to intelligence and gathering intelligence in China is very different, difficult. But right now on the, on the uh, arena of this election, there's no doubt that, that Russia is the more uh, urgent threat. And we've seen that, uh, you know, the CIA, when worried about their sources in Russia, when thinking that uh, Putin is getting too close, will extract them, even if it's at the risk of, of uh, losing their eyes and ears in Moscow. And we've reported that, uh, you know, they're a little more blind now than they used to be, uh, having removed the, the informant who was so important in 2016. Here's not so much a question, but an assertion from JT for you to respond to. Um, he says that the CIA misled JFK about the Bay of Pigs and that without that, um, JFK would have handled the Cuban missile, missile crisis differently. Well, it's no question about it. The, 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 the CIA, I mean, Kennedy felt absolutely betrayed uh, by the CIA over the Bay of Pigs. He felt that he wasn't leveled with. Uh, Bobby Kennedy was f furious. And um, for a time, uh, Kennedy was, was quoted at one point of saying he wanted to scatter it to the winds. Um, <clears throat> so, so that may well be true. Um, uh, and, but I'm sorry, the second part of that was? Well, the, he says that the misleading on the part of the CIA about the Bay of Pigs caused JFK to handle the missile crisis differently? Well, I thought he handled it pretty well. <laughs> um, and, and when you think about it, uh, John McCone, the CIA director during the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, possibly made all the difference. Um, you know, with the combination of, of U-2 photography and the purloined uh, missile manuals that they had um, from a defector, uh, arguably uh, made the difference between a, a peaceful outcome and uh, all hell breaking loose. So I thought, I thought Kennedy handled that one pretty well with, with help from uh, the director. I will not pronounce this name correctly, but here's, a, here's an attempt. Uh, this question is from Sahir Gatti Agrawal. This person asks, do you think the numerous examples of CIA influenced coups like the Shah in Iran and the situations in Chile and Nicaragua, which have led to destabilizing these countries is a problem with White House leadership or the CIA itself? My view on that is that there's always been this perception that the CIA in the late Senator Frank Church's famous phrase was some kind of rogue elephant uh, careening around the world, toppling governments and, and creating, uh, committing all kinds of skullduggery uh, on its own. And I think that's a myth. Uh, as the great Tom Powers told me, the biographer of Richard Helms, if you know what the CIA is doing, you know what the president wants. And if you know what the president wants, you know what the CIA is doing. Uh, almost all of the trouble that the CIA got into over the last 50 years um, was, was a, a result of presidential orders. Um, so I think CIA gets 
something of a bad rap on that. Although I will say that one of the things that brought down John Deutsch, who was uh, Bill Clinton's second director, was a catastrophic uh, bungled attempt to overthrow Saddam, which really was kind of a, seemed to be kind of a rogue operation. Uh, and uh, it helped to end John Deutsch's career. This is a question from George Shea. Does your book cover the relation, if any, of Senator McCarthy to the CIA? No, um, in, a, in a word. Um, I, I could have gone back to that era, and I certainly thought about it. I, th I thought about starting with uh, Dulles, of course, who was the, the first and, and one of the most powerful CIA directors. But I chose to, to start with Richard Helms, who was sort of the quintessential uh, CIA director in the mid 60s. So, so no. Let's see. Um, can you tell us something or recommend a good book about the OSS and the CIA during the Truman and Eisenhower years? Maybe Julian knows some. I mean, off the top of my head, I, I know that Bill Casey wrote his own history. Casey wrote a few books, um, including uh, before he became CIA director, books on how to evade your taxes. Uh, but one of them was a history of the OSS, which was based partly on his experience, which is a, a pretty good read. The, the title escapes me off the top of my head. Somebody can Google it. Um, but um, there, there are a lot of, lot of good histories of the CIA. What do, what do you think, Julian? Yeah, I don't have anything to add. I should have been ready for this because the OSS Society will be sending me an angry email, I'm sure, tomorrow. But uh, we'll stick with your recommendation. Miles asks, how has the Director of National Intelligence affected the role of the CIA director? Well, this is one Julian can answer too. My, so I'll tell you a funny story. I, on at my launch party the other day, I was really lucky. Um, sort of honored to have a couple of CIA directors uh, join us. Um, and John Brennan was there. Uh, Jim Clapper, the DNI, former DNI was there. <clears throat> I was asked this question and I proceeded to say that I, I thought the creation of the DNI in the Director of National Intelligence in 2005, after 9-11 as a reform to try to, try to simplify, try to organize the intelligence community muddled lines of authorities and confused everybody and it didn't work very well. Um, <clears throat> well, Jim Clapper came up on his box and, and tore my head off uh, defending the institution of the DNI. And, and Brennan came on and said he would have found it absolutely impossible to run all 17 intelligence agencies. Uh, he'd knocked himself out just running the CIA and it's true that right now, I, I mean, since in recent years, I think it's, it's worked reasonably well. But Clapper and Brennan were the, an example of two guys who did work very well together, I thought. Uh, the problem right now is that we've got a DNI who is nothing but a, a political partisan who is in Trump's pocket. But what, do you, what would you say, Julian? Well, I think you're right in that the way to look at it is what can the DNI do for to gather up the best stuff from all the other intelligence agencies and get that to the president and, and not get in the way of the CIA directors. Mm -hmm. And then in a best case scenario, it is the DNI who can take the political lumps um, and can take and be a level of insulation um, politically. Now that is not the model we have right now. Um, you know, of course, Mr. Radcliffe will claim to be apolitical, but he's coming from an extremely partisan uh, place and Democrats have definitely seen his actions so far as partisan. Now, will that, if Mr. Trump is reelected, does Mr. Radcliffe being there allow a apolitical CIA director to, to continue? Does it insulate the agency in a second Trump administration? I, I would have my doubts as you kind of indicated, but but theoretically, that might be what happened. It didn't work very well in the beginning. I mean, it was really uh, kind of a clown show, frankly, in the beginning. But I, I think so much depends on who's in those jobs. Um, I think we've got time for maybe one, possibly two more, um, if that's all right with you guys. Sure. 
So uh, another from Sahir Ganti Agrawal. Considering that if the CIA does its job properly and prevents a national security threat, then the general public will not be aware of it. How can the average citizen evaluate the performance of the CIA? Well, the old cliche about that you'll hear from a lot of people at CIA is um, that you hear all about our failures and never about our successes. Um, on the other hand, may, maybe the most famous operation uh, of all time was very well known, and that was the Bin Laden mission. Um, so not all the successes are, are hidden. Um, I think that, um, you know, the, the, they're grown-ups over there, and I think they're used to uh, they're used to laboring anonymously and not taking a whole lot of bows. And um, I think that when the country uh, avoids terrorist attacks, that um, I, I don't think they need a lot of praise and fanfare. Um, what's your view, Julian? Uh, you know that that's right. When you when you do your job, it's not news. When you mess up your job, that then, then it is news. And and you're exactly right. It's not like we don't know that much about the Bin Laden raid. We know a lot about it. And reading your book, we learned a little bit more. Um, just one more from myself. You already mentioned that you don't foresee things going great for the intelligence community uh, in the event of a Trump win. Are you able to foresee at all how the intelligence community would function under a Biden presidency? Well, my guess is it, it, it goes back to, uh, you know, the Obama model. Uh, that's what Biden is accustomed to. Um, I think that worked pretty well. And I think that, um, you know, the irony is that um, John Brennan, who is perceived as such a partisan uh, and, and sometimes negatively by a lot of people because they think that he overdoes his criticism, uh, as CIA, I, as, as CIA director, by all accounts, was the quintessential um, honest broker of intelligence who told Obama stuff absolutely straight. That's what you want in a CIA director. Let's hope that's what Biden wants. Um, I'm, I'm sure Julian and I have heard the same names bandied about. Uh, There's some pretty good candidates out there. Um, so I think I think it goes back to the model it was it 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 was before Trump. Thanks so much to you both. Um, we have some messages of appreciation coming in in the Q and A that. I'm happy to share with you. And before we finish up, I might just leave it to you guys if you have any final words. All I have to say is really uh, delighted to, to be back at Roosevelt House. Hope we can do it next time in person if I ever write another book. Uh, and really, uh, really pleased that uh, Julian Barnes could join me. Chris, thanks for letting me uh, lead the conversation here today. Um, and let me tell the audience, go out and buy this book. It's, you're you're going to learn something. You're really going to enjoy it. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.